This, was, this film was created in a stop motion animation fashion. We used a program called Dragon Frame, which is like a 3D animation software, where we would make a painting. Each painting was about 20 inches by 30 inches large. And we would create um, the painting using the consistency of almost toothpaste. And the numbers that you see on the upper right hand side, that was kind of like the number of the frames that I was working on. And every time I finished a frame, I would need to cross it out so that I would know to look for that corresponding frame in the Dragon Frame program. Because you wouldn't want to accidentally skip over a frame or accidentally photograph a frame twice. So on average, it took about between two to maybe six hours to make a frame, depending on the level of complexity. Sometimes you could finish a frame in as little as like maybe an hour and a half. The idea was to try to scrape away some of the paint and then reapply some of that same paint in the area to try to get that uh, moving effect. You wouldn't necessarily have to start over on the frame exactly. There would still be a little bit of that ghost image behind. And in this scene particularly, it was a pretty still scene. There wasn't a lot of action going on. The characters, Dr. Gachet and Armand, they're having a conversation. So there's just little bits of body movement that are going back and forth. So I'd be able to like scrape away the paint very easily and then reapply it. Um, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? Because there's so many things that I could go into detail about, but I'm wondering if anyone has any questions about anything about the film or the process. We have microphones, just wait for the microphone to get to you. using a green screen background. And then the frames were created from that, kind of like translating the footage into an outline format, a very rough outline format. And then the outline format was then delivered to the different animator stations. Uh, some of the, I was in the Gdansk Poland station. There were some animators also in Greece. And so uh, for the black and white frames, what would happen is they would, the black and white signified kind of what had happened in the past. And so those frames would then be delivered to the artists that were working in the black and white palette. They would take those outlines and then they would project those outlines onto the canvas about, uh, again, like 20 by 30 inches. And then they would paint those frames individually using a black and white palette. Yeah. Great question. Um, I'm wondering whether or not you had any interfacing with the other artists. Interfacing like interactions with the yes. other artists? Yes, yes. I, I stayed with some of the other artists. We stayed together um, in a house um, in Gdansk. It was uh, one of those like Airbnb type situations. There was about eight of us in one house for a time. Um, and then I stayed in a flat uh, very close to the studio, but it was located in the old uh, version of the Gdansk. Like, um, of course, Gdansk was actually a part of Poland that was you know, there was a lot of damage done there from World War II. So the area that I was in, they had recently in the 1950s, 1960s, renovated that area. And it is this gorgeous like downtown section, but it, it had like this facade. You could still see some of the buildings that had been destroyed from World War II. But that area that I was staying in, um, the little flat, it was in that historic part of uh, Gdansk. But yes, some of the animators, they, we did stay with each other for a little bit in the house, like in Airbnbs. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, while I was there, there were four other American animators working. Um, they were all women, and I still keep in contact with uh, three of those animators. Well, she's going up to there. Yes, sir. I just wondered, you said you created these frames by moving some of the paint and scraping it away to create the motion, but each time you had to then capture that somehow, right? Yes, so in order to capture each frame, you would apply the paint. It was about a toothpaste consistency. We would use um, this material called clove oil. Clove oil allows the paint to not dry because we would spend a lot of time mixing the paint, sometimes like eight hours mixing large puddles of paint and then try to maintain that paint so it doesn't dry overnight so we don't have to mix it again. So we would take that very thick paint, almost like a toothpaste consistency, apply it to the canvas, 
And then once we were done with that and we photographed that frame, um, my station, um, I, I didn't bring a photo of it, but it looked very much like a cubicle. So I'm sitting in a chair and there's my um, canvas board that I'm working on. So I have to lean back and I push a button and the camera, like a Canon DS, uh, um, DSLR T3i Rebel would photograph the frame. And then I would go back to the frame and I would use a palette knife and like lightly gently scrape off that area that was gonna move and then also go over to the other areas that weren't gonna move as much, but kind of like move, like disturb the paint strokes just enough. So that way it would um, kind of translate over into the next frame. You can see some frames where the paint didn't move as much and it kind of created a little bit of a stagnant quality in that part. So um, a principle of animation is you wanna make sure that there's always some sort of basic motion to kind of keep it from from like getting stuck in between frames. So I would remove it with the palette knife and then reapply the next frame by projecting the outlines of that frame onto the canvas board and then painting over that. It's very, it was a very tedious thing, but it was very rewarding. It would be interesting to see the painting um, come to life in between frames. And so with Dragon Frame, you can push a couple of um, arrows like on the keyboard and you can see a series of your frames back to back and you see these really neat motions coming to life. So there are these really neat paintings and it's very odd to destroy them. So you would make the painting and then you'd, you'd bring the palette knife over it and kind of start to destroy it. It'd be kind of like gut-wrenching at first. You're like, this painting's getting ready to be destroyed. I don't like this. But then after you take a photo of that frame and then the next two or three frames, you start to see your scene like come to life. It's, it's a really neat experience. But there is. When did you guys start this project? What year? I believe it started in, let's see, it was released in 2017. So I believe that it started in 2010 because I'm pretty sure they were working on it for six to seven years before they were able to release it in 2017. I was working on it in the summer of 2016 um, from, I wanna say, uh, early mid-May up until around the mid or late August area. I know probably maybe another question, but the question I have is, have you seen the Van Gogh immersion experience? Yes, so I got to speak at one of those events in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I think it was 2022, 21, and it's an amazing event. Um, I think that we should have something like that here. I believe um, I so think too. we need to have something and like that. And I believe your yes. project, this project would be amazing on the 3D platform. And I don't know who here saw the 3D platform because there were two different Van Gogh exhibits. Yes. But this was just, it was so beautiful. Very well done and very touching too. So thank you so much. No, um, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, we need to have something like an immersive exhibit for Van Gogh, for other artists here because there's we have the space um, and we have a lot of amazing artists in this area already. New Bedford is a, a really amazing artist city so it would be definitely feasible to make that happen. It would just be a matter of you know, all the basic, what, where, when, why, how, how much, but that should happen. Michael. So we're looking at a few seconds of animation here. How long did yeah. it take you to make this? So, let's see, how many frames do we have over here? Um, let's see. He's wondering how long did this section take to create? So I was looking at the, the frame numbers over here. So it's 19 down to 51. So that's every other, so we're looking at probably Say like almost almost a month maybe ish not quite but almost yeah. and so you can see some parts of the of the frame they're not quite at they're not moving as much compared to the others um, and the playhead's kind of in the way of it but you can see I'm not the only one that did this there's other artists that did this if you notice um, in certain parts of the film you can see signatures that artists placed their their name. Um, and so that's one Easter egg right there. And there's also other Easter eggs where artists would like sign their name or add like a smiley face to the film in different parts of the timeline. Do you know how many paintings you did and how many minutes of it was um, in the I would say like my number is probably right around 100, 120, somewhere in there. I don't remember exactly, but it's not even minutes, it's seconds, if that. It is hardly a drop in the bucket. Um, there were about 65,000 paintings that were created for this film. We used a, a technique where we animate on twos, meaning every time we would make a painting that was um, 
last for two frames. We were animating at 24 frames a second, and so that meant that for each second there's 24 frames, but since we were animating on twos, it meant that we only had 12 frames to create for a second. Can you use the microphone so everybody can hear you? Were you aware um, how your section was going to fit into the film all the way through the process? No, it was not. So it was a solitary effort all the way It was, so, yes, it was a solitary studio. So um, I knew I didn't want to work in corporate at a cubicle, but we were in cubicles working. And so um, the studio was very, very clever. You needed to have absolute darkness in order to be able to control the projection on your frame every time you drew a new image. So you need to be able to turn the lights off, turn on the projector, you would then have the outline projected onto the canvas, and then you would draw the next frame. Well, everybody's working in different rates. So if you had everybody working in the same room, the lights would keep flashing on and off. It'd be very difficult to work. And so they created these really um, small cubicle-esque like offices with drywall. Um, the air in that's circulating in the space was not was not the best setup. It was not up to health standards by any means. But um, there were these little cubicles they made, and they had curtains like over the doors, and you had the ability to turn the lights on and off in your studio. And then you also had the ability to um, like it, it looks like a like a little hallway, and you'd walk down the hallway and you'd see like all these other curtains where other fellow studio artists were working. And so um, I was one of the artists that came in at the very end which meant that I was filling in little holes of the film. And this was the largest part that I had worked on as far as time-wise goes. But we did, we did work in isolation spatially, but you could hear each other. Like every time someone made a small mistake, like if they accidentally forgot to photograph their frame and they had to repaint their frame again because they thought they had photographed it and they had already scraped it out, you could hear people dropping F-bombs in different <laughs> languages. They're like, oh, I, I didn't photograph that. I have to paint it again. So you could, it wasn't soundproof, but at the same time it was separated enough that you know, they did a really great job um, allowing us to have control over the light. So they put us in like little cubicle type spaces. I just want to know how were you guys um, found or first involved in the whole process? Like, did you have to audition? Did you submit work? Did they find you? How did you find all of the artists? That is a really good question. Are there any um, young artists in here? Are there any uh, working artists or any artists who are in the professional field? In any, forget the word young. Any artists in here who are still active in the professional scene in any way that are looking for um, commissions, work, shows, right? So we talk about this sometimes in the careers class. This was a situation where there was not a, there was a direct call out for artists. I missed that call, I never got that call. I didn't know the project was going on at all. Um, a friend of mine sent me a video about this project. Um, it was in direct alignment with what I was already doing in my studio practice, which was painting and animation together. And so I did what I would encourage any artist to do, uh, contact the party in charge, find their website, find their email address, find their phone number, and see if you can get in contact with them and say, hey, I'm interested in working on this project. And then I sent them my, what would be called like an animation reel, examples of the work. And then I didn't hear back from them for almost a month. And then I got an email saying, we think we'd be interested in having you work on this project, basically. They didn't say we think, they just said, would you like to come work on this project, potentially? And you need to come out to Poland to do this. What I didn't know was they were saying, would you like to come for an interview? Fly out to Poland for an interview. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I get there and um, again, I was a part of the animation circle that was a part of the uh, filling in the holes where the film, still, the film still needed animators. So they set us up in these like large like rooms, like not quite the cubicles yet, and they had us animate over some of the sections of the film to see what we could do. And if we were able to pass that, then we were able to be one of the animators. But people heard about this film through, I think, the website initially, or maybe there was some sort of call. It was produced um, in Poland. That was the home uh, country where it was made, so I'm sure they did lots of calls for artists in Poland, and they quickly ran out of artists because the budget that they were working on this film, I want to say it was less than $2 million total. It was a very small budget, 
And so they quickly started to run out of artists. And other artists that were coming in from across the world, um, they were staying maybe a month, maybe a, as little as a month, as long as maybe a year. One of my friends, Charlene Mosley, she's an amazing artist based out in California. She stayed for the rest of, I was there in 2016, her and I got there at the same time at the late spring. She stayed into the winter of 2016. So she stayed a little bit longer. So it was, it was kind of like a word of mouth. I heard about it through a friend who sent me a message about it through Facebook. And so it was just, yeah, it was a very happenstance thing. But it was also one of those um, types of opportunities where you see something and even if it doesn't come directly at you as an invitation, maybe inquire about it, send an email to somebody, ask like, hey, I heard about this project. I'm interested in working on that. Here's a website to my work. Here's an example. Is there somebody that I could communicate with? Because you'd be surprised what kind of doors open up. How many cities has been in tour? How many cities has what? Um, I have, I wouldn't say I technically was on tour. Um, I spoke about this film in North Carolina, in Charlotte. I've gone down to New York, um, out to Providence, up to Boston. So um, it wasn't down tour, but every time I knew that it was showing, like when it first premiered here in the States, I went down. I was in New York, uh, my husband and I, we were visiting a friend, and we went to go check it out. Um, Providence, there was places like the Cable Car, which I, I, I missed the Cable Car. Those, has anyone ever been to the Cable Car Theater before? Yeah. We went to go uh, see it there, and I presented it there. Um, and then um, I spent, well, my artist career kind of started in North Carolina, so a friend called and flew me down there for the immersive Van Gogh exhibit to speak at one of those. So that's, I'd say like uh, four or five cities. A couple of friends, there's one friend, Seamus, um, I can't think of his last name, he was uh, one of the animators in Ireland. I know that he went and did a couple of speaking engagements. That artist that I mentioned earlier, Charlene Mosley, she's done a couple of speaking engagements. She's based out in uh, California. She's doing some amazing work. She's starting to do more paintings. Also, she's starting to get into the mural world, so I know that she's worked with this project. Um, and. Uh, another friend, Pamela, um, I'm going to be so bad, I don't remember their last names, but um, a girlfriend of mine, Pamela, she's based in Philadelphia. She's an amazing mural artist. She's used this um, as an opportunity to speak about her work as well and then shown the film. I think she's um, talked at one of the immersive exhibits as well, but that's in the Philadelphia area. I want to know how many of, of your students are here today. Are there any? I saw Ben, one of them. And then I thought I saw another one, Allison, maybe come in, but she might have left earlier. Ben was inspired to do his own original piece of art. If you haven't seen it yet, on the way out, he'll show it to you. And we actually have some posters that would be fun if your student and you sign before yeah, you go. Ben did an amazing job illustrating the posters for this. Ben, I actually would love to give a round of applause to Ben for that, because that design came out so well. <laughs> works here at the museum. We're happy to have them. These are wonderful questions. Um, does anybody, is, is there anything else? Any other? So exhibit, so I've been experimenting a lot with animation. There's a small animation production team that I started to put together to create animated videos. It's going towards the music direction. There's a really amazing music scene in New Bedford, and so I'm working on building this animation team to help produce animated content for this area. And then um, there's painting and drawing. I have a studio at the Kilburn Mills that I host uh, figure painting and figure drawing sessions as like a continuation of like the figurative art. Um, and there's, I don't have a show coming up at a gallery yet. Um, there is a show that I'm putting together as a more of a curator at the Co-Creative Center downtown, located on Union Street. That's going to be in November. That's actually going to be an open call. There's going to be a call going um, out for that in, I want to say, early October. And that show is called The Curious Figure. And the only rule for that show, it has to be either drawing, painting, um, printmaking, illustration, digital, or traditional. And it's just about a, a figure in some sort of curious space. It could be a narrative curiosity. It could be a spatial, like spatial bending curiosity, like surrealism or anything. 
So I'm getting into the world of trying to curate shows and also try to bring more young artists into the art scene. And, and they have all sorts of different strengths, either creators, makers, organizers, communicators, coordinators, or whatnot. So I'm, I'm getting more involved in that event side of things right now. Thank you all. Thank you, Kat. Thank you.